First of all, here are the takeaways from part one of the video. Hormones must bind to and activate receptors across the body in order to produce effects. Receptor regulation is the process of these receptors increasing or decreasing in number and sensitivity and is a regular part of hormonal homeostasis and is normally not related to pathology. The end result of activating a receptor, as well as receptor regulation, is both localized and context dependent. In most contexts, receptor agonism will lead to upregulation, while antagonism or inactivity will lead to downregulation, but that is not always the case. A disturbance in receptor regulation could lead to a chronic imbalance in hormonal activity with detrimental results in an individual's health. Okay, so what does this all tell us about AR overexpression in the syndromes? First of all, just because AR overexpression has been detected in penile tissue in PFS does not make it a consistent finding across the entire body of a patient. We cannot be certain as to how other organs may have been affected by this if they have been affected at all. It would make sense to hypothesize that the affected areas are those where finasteride acts most strongly, but this is not necessarily true. Finasteride is after all shown to reduce serum DHT by upwards of 60%. In other words, systemic DHT activity is significantly reduced and finasteride even crosses the blood-brain barrier with clear evidence of it affecting neurosteroid levels. And all this is without even taking individual variation into account. Secondly, with receptor regulation being a context-dependent process, there are no promises that AR alterations will be the same across organs. Even if other organs are affected, ARs could be overexpressed in one place and underexpressed in another, as the way each structure responds to androgen deprivation may be different. Thus, not only do we not yet know which organs are affected and to what degree, but we also don't know how each organ is affected. And finally, we discussed previously a possible discrepancy between receptor expression and hormonal activity. That's because receptor count is not the only factor that determines eventual resulting hormonal activity. Without having fully investigated the remaining variables and how they may be affected, both hormonal overactivity and underactivity remain possible end results despite an increased receptor expression. So we cannot be confident as to what receptor overexpression signifies, even if we were to establish where it is present and how consistently. A lot more research would be needed would be necessary on this subject. It gets complicated, but the point is our current understanding of finasteride does not allow us to be certain that whatever is going on in penile tissue in PFS is happening across the body of the patient or what it exactly points to. So until the data becomes available, I think it's better to approach the issue from a more practical perspective. Androgen overexpression most likely points towards one of two things. Too much androgenic activity or too little androgenic activity. I think the wisest thing to do would be to try and determine which one of the two sounds more like our case based on what we know the effects of androgenic activity to be. We can tell apart too much androgenic activity from too little. It involves knowing the physiological and psychological effects of androgens and being able to tell them apart from those of estrogens and other sex hormones. However, on an individual basis, this is obviously easier said than done, especially outside of a clinical context. And we also need to keep in mind that precisely because of the localized nature of these issues, their presentation would not necessarily match already known phenotypes of a similar nature, making it even harder to identify them. Instead, a more generalized perspective that takes into account our current under understanding of the presentations of these syndromes, as well as the experience we've gathered so far from the community and the trials, I think is by far currently the best way to go about contemplating this issue, at least until further research is done. And this perspective arguably points towards overactivity. People with PSSD or PFS tend to respond unfavorably to increases in androgens and at the same time exhibit symptoms that are more in line with this sort of issue. What I want to focus on in this regard is the inhibitory effect of androgens on estrogenic effects. It has been known in scientific liter literature for a long time now that DHT and its derivatives inhibit estrogenic activity. The level at which this takes place has remained more or less unclear, but evidence seems to point to a mechanism 
that blocks the effects of estrogen either by blocking its receptor or blocking estrogen estrogen induced RNA transcription even after the molecule has bound to its receptor. This is why BHD derivatives have been used as a successful breast cancer treatment in the past. Specifically, drostanolone was the most prescribed medication for this kind of purpose before the advent of aromatase inhibitors and more effective CIRMs, selective estrogen receptor modulators. So in other words, BHD antagonizes estrogen, breast cancer tends to feed off of estrogen in order to grow, and so they would use drostanolone, which is a BHD derivative, in order to block estrogenic activity enough to starve the cancer off of estrogen and shrink it down to non-existence. So it is through this same mechanism that androgen overactivity, in other words, a localized positive imbalance in DHT activity in certain tissues can lead to an equally localized chronic suppression of estrogenic effects in that same tissue. Both the existing oversensitivity to androgens and the resulting estrogenic resistance can be prime suspects for many of the dysfunctions brought on by the syndromes. So in my original document, the role of androgens in the pathology was yet unclear, and so was the explanation as to how the proposed estrogenic resistance would come to be. After some more learning, alongside the experience gained from the trials, I believe the above mechanism uh, offers the most substantiated answer to this question. Now, there's a lot we could talk about. Um, both regarding the effects of androgens and their possible contributions to the issues, but it would be fairly time consuming and perhaps even irrelevant at this point. So instead, I'll leave part two here and get to the conclusions and practical part in the next and final video. See you soon.